Welcome to Fitz Dog Radio. It's the holiday season, isn't it? Time to meet with your loved ones as much as you can during the pandemic. I know a lot of people are mixed. My mom is uh, out for Thanksgiving still, and it's so good to see her. I haven't seen her in a year, and I got to tell you, I love my mom. And I'm not just saying that because she's suddenly listening to my podcast. Hi, Mom. Get ready for some shit. Get ready for me talking about masturbation and, uh, you know, inappropriate things that you taught me not to talk about. But she's listening, and... um, But she's with me, and we're having a blast, as always. She's a fun lady. And um, don't forget, during the holiday season, we're offering a special on the Grapefruit Simmons T-shirts. They are high-quality cotton stock. They're beautiful. People love them. 10% off until Christmas. Pick them up at FitzDog.com. And then also don't forget the premium membership, which is, uh, I think, $19 $19 a year, but you get, not, I think it's close to 900 episodes at this point. And uh, check those out. Support the show. Be a Fitz Dog Radio. Be a, be a Fitz Pup. Anyway, a um, lot going on. I was just in Tampa Bay, Florida, doing some shows last weekend. Thanks for everybody for coming out. Had some fun crowds. A lot of... Uh, a lot of mullets, uh, a couple MAGA hats. We had um, nobody wearing masks. I would wear a mask to the stage, and then by the time I got there, there were people yelling at me to take my mask off. They were upset that I would care about standing in front of 200 people who were expelling laughter in my direction. So, and very little concern. So I, 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 I still could have it. Who knows? Who knows? I keep getting tested, but we'll see. What else happened in Tampa? It was it was good to see them all. There's a waitress there who is from the Bronx, from the uh, from the neighborhood that my mom grew up in. Literally like six houses down from my mom on Edison Avenue in Throgs Neck in the Bronx, and where my grandfather raised his Kids, his, I think five, five kids. One died young from something. There was always one. When you had big Irish families back in, you know, the 40s, people people lost kids. Like, it was a regular, they had more kids, I think, because they knew they were going to lose one. Um, but how painful that that was a regular thing. Tuberculosis and uh, measles. And there was a bunch of stuff that we have inoculations for now that people died from. And abuse, no, I don't think so. I'm a little out of it today. I've been uh, working on uh, helping a friend who's doing a a movie, film script, doing some punch-up work on it, but it's wearing me out. Um, What else? Watching The Crown on Netflix. I'm addicted to that series. It's season four. And it's unbelievable. It's one of the best series ever made. And every season gets better and better. And this is the season with Lady Di, who died. And she's adorable. She's You just fucking fall in love with her. And the whole time, it's very tragic because you know that she's going to die. And she's so hot. She's like the hottest prince. Because most of these royal people, you see the paintings. They're all the product of incest. It's just like seven families interbreeding for thousands of years. And their eyes are too close together. And they have kind of doughy fat faces. And they're blanched. They're just pasty white. Uh, and bad hair, big foreheads. And then comes Lady Di, who is a dancer. She's got a smoking hot body, cute face. She's got the little, she's got the little haircut going. And, uh, you know, she was a nymph. I can tell you right now that she was a nymph and Charles couldn't handle it. Prince Charles. His big ass ears. Cheating on her. How do you cheat on her? She's 13 years younger than you. You scored the lottery 10 times, Charles. But really, I can't believe I'm watching this series about the royal family when I hate the British. I hate what they did to Ireland. 
You know, in the 18th century, they starved us to death. 19th century. I think it was in like 1840, maybe. There was a famine and the British continued to export. They controlled Ireland and they made us grow the food and then they exported all of it. Then there was a potato blight, a famine, and they let a million people starve to death. The fucking British. Like they did to India, like they did to, to all over Africa. They're fucking animals. And I can't believe I'm watching this series about the royal family, this out of touch, snobby symbol of this out of touch colonial power. But you can't stop watching it. I don't know what it is. The Irish have always been fascinated with the British royalty. I can remember my mom being very into Queen Elizabeth and then my wife watching Lady Di's wedding like it was more important than her own birth of her children. I'll tell you that right now. She wasn't as excited. I saw her face when our kids came out. She was happy. She smiled. Lady Di, she cried. Se I looked it up. 750 million people watched Lady Di's wedding. And, and then she died. But they're, yeah, they're pigs. They're pigs. Anyway, let's get to it. My guest today, David Zucker. We'll get to him in a minute. But in the, but in the meantime, let's bang out a couple overheards. You guys hear stuff. You're, you're my eyes and ears on the street. You report it to me. Uh, from all over the country, all different kinds of places, you hear stuff that we think might be compelling and interesting. This is from Devin Carlisle. And overheard for you, I currently live in Charlotte, North Carolina. While at a local Walmart, I witnessed a couple that I could only describe as, quote, unfuckables. I think that's uh, David Tell line. He would describe him and his friends as the unfuckables. And they were arguing over buying dinner. They decided on chili, and the man stormed off, exclaiming, quote, Well, now we have to get peanut butter. As I had stated earlier, I'm from Indiana. Peanut butter sandwiches are a staple when making chili. You dip them in it, eat it. It's really something. Is it? Is it really something? Or is it really fucking gross? I get comfort food. I understand guilty pleasures. But come on. Peanut butter and chili? Two gooey things together? What does that look like? How does that play out in your mouth? How do you not vomit it up and it looks exactly the same? Now, I got to travel. I mean, that's the kind of thing that uh, Anthony Bourdain probably would have found and found interesting. But that was because he was fucked up the whole time. When you're high and drunk, you know, f food like peanut butter chili seems more interesting. And he can even make these people seem... No offense to you, Devin Carlisle. I'm talking about the people that are buying this stuff in Walmart. Are they fun? Are they wearing fucking uh, Hornets jerseys because it hides your weight? And watching TV on a real tube TV? Is that a perfect night eating peanut butter and chili? Watching, uh, watching one of those CBS shows like NCIS, Cleveland. What, which city are they down to now on NCIS? Have they covered? Have they covered everybody? This is from David Fison. I was at a car museum in Tacoma. Two old guys walking up the stairs. Classic red nose guys. Quote, sloppy. It's got to be sloppy. Now. He could be talking about peanut butter and chili sandwiches. He could be talking about, I hate to say it, a woman's private parts. They're old dudes. Maybe that's what they're into. I don't know. My mom's listening, so I'm not going to go deep into it. Let's hope it's something else. But old guys are not sweet. That's the thing I'm realizing as I get older and I play golf with some of these older guys here in Venice Beach at the Penmar golf course is that uh young guys are pigs old guys are pigs they don't become sweet and nice they're they're you know they're men and men in that generation they only get worse because you get to a certain age and women aren't even looking back 
You you could stare at a woman. She's not even going to look back at you. And if she does, she doesn't even care that you're staring. It's a free-for-all. These guys are, you know, they'll even talk about a woman while she's standing there. They're pigs. They're pigs. But they can get away with it because they're rich. I can't wait to get a little older. This is from Vic Corey. It's the last one. My mom told me that her dad used to say, uh, and he was Irish, if someone was not that good looking, he'd say, you know she's not two-faced. If she was, she'd have the other one on. Nice. Nice slam, dad. I guess you can get away with saying something mean about her because she's, because because he's ultimately saying that she's not two-faced, right? She's a nice person. She's honest. Isn't being two-faced considered the least likable trait in a human being? I mean, all you have to find out is that a celebrity was mean to their assistant, and they're kind of dead man walking. You're kind of done with them. You got to have one face. You got to have one face to everybody. I learned that young. That's how my dad treated people. Tell my mom, check out. I got to stop talking about my mom. Stop listening. Go listen to NPR. Listen to the moth. All right. And my intro, here it is. David Zucker. This guy is literally one of my comedy heroes. And I was so thrilled to get a chance to talk to him, which was going back a few weeks, actually. I think it was the week of the election. And he is the guy who wrote and directed Airplane all the airplane movies, all the Naked Gun movies. He uh, he directed scary movies, the, you know, the scary movies. Kentucky Fried Movie, Ruthless People, and then that TV show Police Squad. If you missed that, find it on YouTube. It was fucking great. This guy is a joke machine. Nobody has made comedies as good as this guy. Him and his brother and this other guy, Abrams, they were called Zaz. They were a team of directors who did all these movies together. They knew each other from when they were like 18 years old. And uh, and I just, I don't know a movie as straight up funny as Airplane. I think it might be my favorite comedy of all time. I would say Raising Arizona, um, Blazing Saddles, the first Borat movie. I think those might be the greatest comedy. Am I forgetting one? Probably the Marx Brothers duck soup. I don't know. We might even talk about this in the podcast. I can't remember. Anyway, what am I doing wasting time? You guys can't wait to hear me talk to David Zucker. So here it is. Enjoy. Welcome to Fitz Dog Radio. I'm joined today by one of my comedy heroes, David Zucker. He is the uh, writer, director of some of the great parody films of all time, uh, Airplane, the Naked Gun series, and on and on. We'll talk about all of that stuff. But uh, David, um, honestly, from, from my heart, I thought about this a lot in the last few days because I've been looking forward to talking to you. And I don't know that anybody except maybe Mel Brooks has affected my comedy voice starting in high school and the 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 way you have always taken things right you found the line and you sat right on it and that that's where i think comedy should be i agree Uh, whatever that line is yeah and uh you know i'm a mel brooks fan too so yeah it's good company thank you he's a neighbor he, well, sort of. Oh, he's a neighbor? He's, his, his son is. So he's, he kicks around oh, the neighborhood a lot. It's always a thrill. Yeah, so he's like, he must be like 98 now or something? I think he's 93. Nine, oh, 93. Well, that's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I could be wrong. He could be older. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah. So um, anyway, there's a lot to talk to because we, we, we just talked about the line. And the line uh, has changed pretty frequently and pretty drastically in the last, particularly in the last 10 years. And, you know, I rewatched Airplane last night with my daughter, who'd, who'd already seen it about five times. Might have been the 20th time I've seen it. And it, and it really is. And then I remember going back to K- the Kentucky Fried movie of like, 
you couldn't make those films today. Or I should say, would you make those films today? Well, uh, you know, I mean, of course, it always changed. You know, we, you know, we, of course, moved on from Kentucky Fried Movie or Airplane. But I, I do get asked that question when we show uh, Airplane at screenings. And people laugh just the same. I mean, they, they just laugh exactly as they did when the movie came out. But, uh, and then I get asked the question in the Q&A afterwards, could you make Airplane today? And I always say, of course we could, just without the jokes. <laughs> and, you know, the jokes yeah, are still right. funny. It's, yeah. the, it's the studio executive boardrooms that have changed, and they're all frightened. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think I've, I've said that, you know, comedy isn't dead, it's just scared. That's and a good so, line. So you have a bunch of scared people around. Uh, and then and I've been there in the, in, the, in the studio pitches. And, you know, we had this innocent joke on and one of our pitches. Um, it was a secret agent uh, spoof. And this was only in, this was really in the last year. And uh, it was a pretty innocent joke to say, you know, I, I had a, the female agent said I had a breast reduction because I couldn't fit into the Kevlar vest. You know, it's, it's a mild gag. It's not, yeah. Yeah. ha ha, but uh, this lady pointed that out as something that, you know, would be problematic. Right. So it's just, it's silly how, but, but, you know, we have to fight against that, of course. But I think when you say problematic, that's, it's very relative and it's, uh, it, you know, it changes like, I think the studio executives are so worried about the Daily Beast or whatever, whatever blog or website comments and points these things out. That's right. what seems to dictate what the networks do instead of, like you said, the people that are sitting in the theater. Right. And that is problematic. So, you know, uh, and you have that, um, that woman, Barry Weiss, who was, you know, pretty middle of the road and she, was, she had to resign from the New York Times. Right. Because, and I think she she said that, you know, the, the New York Times editorial board is now controlled by Twitter. Yeah. So and that's it's weird, you know, but yeah. in comedy, it could be. So we put this innocent, silly Kevlar vest gag. In it. And so who knows what feminists in their basements will be blogging and tweeting about that. And then they create this artificial firestorm, I suppose. So um, that, that's what frightens the studio executives. So I'm glad it's, I'm glad uh, 1980 was not 2020. Yeah. Because then it, it would be tough. And just, just think about all the comedy that is kind of being smothered by this now. Well, there's so, still South Park, which gives me hope. Right, um, yeah, South Park. So... The South Park gets away with it and, and they get away with it just, you know, taking it head on. Yeah. But they're not doing movies, you know, so um, movies are different. You know, we, you know, we supposedly open on a certain date in theaters and people can focus on that. Yeah. And uh, oppose it. Right. So who knows what would have happened to Bell, Mel Brooks with blazing saddles in oh my god the yeah climate. i mean right it would History be of the all, world had a lot of slave jokes in it that wouldn't fly yeah, today but it was squarely um you know that movie his heart was in the right obviously uh, mel brooks did not mean anything racist or anything but no. it was just pretty free swinging let's just say what we want and go for gags which is fine Right. And I think that's the thing that inspired me about you guys for me was always like, um, there's context and there's irony to what we're saying. We're not coming out to make a statement. We're not lecturing at a college. We're trying to make people laugh. Right. And for me, like it's different with stand up comedy because you know what room you're in. If I'm, if I'm at the Largo theater in Los Angeles, that's filled with a lot of people that, you know, have a, have a, a double, double latte from Air One and they're wearing hemp pants and, and I know what the line is there. And then I go to the comedy store where you've got down and dirty comics, Anthony Jeselnik and people that are pushing the line. I know my line changes, but w when you put it on film, that's it. That's the one version of it for every group of people to see. Right. 
and they can focus on that on a certain date. And, uh, but uh, I don't know, we'll see, you know, I'm hoping, you know, comedy will, will survive. Right. Um, what I like, what I like is when I think about what makes my friends laugh, that's the sense I get from you is that there, there's no filter between what you think would make your friends laugh and then what you put out. And that's where it should be. Yeah, no, we, we absolutely, you know, we go for whatever we think is funny, but you know, sometimes we do reconsider some things, um, you know, some things that are, you know, funny, but offensive, you know, in, in, in the writing room may not translate to in public. So right. you no, know, we've had, you know, we've had those things happen and I'm glad we cut those things out. So because yeah. I, I don't like anything that's mean spirited. Right. You know, whatever we did was, you know, to make some satirical point, even the relentless breast jokes, you know, the, had a satirical point. So, except an airplane. What was the satirical was, point of, <laughs> of the yeah. breast jokes? Oh, well, like, for instance, in Kentucky Fried Movie. Oh, you know, really? We're, that we're, was you know, making fun of, uh, you know, the, the porn movies. You know, it was, yeah. like, it, was, it was to show how ridiculous they were. And, right. Uh, so, um, and then there were some other things, you know, like Catholic high school girls in trouble. Yeah, wow. yeah, that was yeah. great. And they, so, uh, remember, there was, always, there was always a point to it. Uh, yeah. I was working on a TV show. I, I write for shows as well. And I, I worked on a show called um, Childish. It was an HBO show. And so there was a nude scene. Uh, it was a sex scene between the lead and, the, uh, and his girlfriend on the show. And it was like there was live plutonium on set. Everybody was put in the next building. The only people <laughs> left were like the three cameramen, the sound guy, the director, and the, and the talent. And there was a consultant. There was a sex consultant. Yeah, and a, and a social major on set and you yeah. know, everything. You got to, right. yeah, it's like not the way it used to be. Yeah, they actually put protesters in the shot just to get ahead of the uh, curve. Curve. Oh, <laughs> and then the protesters probably weren't uh, averse to participating. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it just comes down to boobs. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, and I think it goes. Yeah, it's it's the National Lampoon. Uh, you know, they always had a lot of gratuitous sexuality too, and you know, it's uh, yeah. It, you know, I don't know. Does that skew male? That's what they would say, but I don't think so. I mean, well, my daughter sees all these same movies as me, and she's a feminist, and she loves it. Yeah, I think you gotta. You have to. You know, it's it. It is. You know, a a litmus test. If it makes you laugh, then you know, there must be something good about it. However, you know, there are some things that I don't think it's good to laugh at. And so, like in the airplane, I tell a story. There was we had this joke about Air Poland and it was Jose the pilots were Jose Feliciano, Ray Charles, and Stevie Wonder. <laughs> and you know it makes you laugh, but somebody from the Anti-Defamation League pointed out to us that, you know, young Polish kids were growing up with this terrible self-image. And you know, actually that made sense to us. And uh -huh. actually I'm glad that we we cut it because uh, we have still photos of it and Jose, Jose Feliciano was actually there. Uh, you know, we have, we, I'm glad we cut it because it's kind of like, you know, Polish jokes are kind of musty now, you know, they're, yeah. they're from, they're from 40 years ago. And yeah. I don't think it's funny today to, to do that. And I do agree that if you, if you just harp on one segment of the population, you know, I, it made sense to me. Kids probably would grow up and, you know, thinking ill of themselves. I didn't want to be a part of that. Not because I'm such a good person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just it made sense. And then I was glad we did because, you know, it, uh, I think I would have cringed today. But that's yeah, just, yeah. that's one example of it's, uh, we happen to laugh, everybody laughed, but it's, it's not, it wouldn't be, that doesn't necessarily mean we should leave it in. Well, and don't forget, you also would have gotten hit from the uh, the Blind Defamation League. That, without a doubt, they would have yeah. found that offensive. Yeah, which wasn't in existence in 1980, but would be today, I'm sure. Yeah, who saw that coming? Yeah. Um, 
So uh, I guess I want to go back to uh, the Kentucky Fried movie because that really was like, when I was in high school, I had a cable access show. It was a comedy show. And yeah. we used to do really outrageous stuff. And when I, and, I, and I think it was probably inspired by watching that movie more than anything. When did that come out? In like 76? 77 it came 77? out. 77? Okay. But we had written Airplane in 75. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, and the first draft of Airplane, and we, you know, we took her out, we were trying to get financing for it, you know, we, we, you know, we couldn't raise a dime. And, uh, and so John Landis came to our, see our show, our Kentucky Fried Theater show in, in L.A. And, you know, we happened to be running a show called My Nose. Was, and we called it that because, uh, so our weekly L.A. Times listing would read, My Nose runs continuously. So, you know, that was yeah, our yeah. way of, you know, yeah. getting a little chuckle. And, uh, Wait, just to go back for a sec, with, with the Kentucky Fried uh, Theater, was that something you did in college and then continued uh, Well, right after college, we did it in Madison, Wisconsin. We all went okay. to the University of Wisconsin. Yeah. We did the show there for a year in 1971, loaded up a U-Haul truck, moved to L.A. and set up, set up on wow. Pico Boulevard in West L.A. across <laughs> the street from Rancho Park. Yeah. And, you know, it was, it was packed all the time. And, uh, and, 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 uh, John Landis came to see the show one night and we had, you know, we had known him before, but uh, he, he said, uh, why don't you guys do a movie about your show? And Landis doesn't remember it that way. He thinks Bob Weiss, our producer, suggested it, but I, uh, I don't miss these things. I yeah, know, yeah. I have a, you know, open shut memory. Mostly yeah. shut, but, um, so, so we, that's when we did, so we did Kentucky Fried Movie. It was really a good thing that we did because, I don't think we, we, we were going to have somebody else direct Airplane because, you know, we didn't know really how to direct a movie. But after we did Kentucky Fried Movie with Landis, we realized, well, we can do this. And we learned a lot from John. And by the time, then we went back after Kentucky Fried Movie was released and was a hit, we went back, rewrote Airplane, the Airplane script. And, uh, and we started circulating around again. But this time we were insisting that we directed it. So... You know, it's kind of weird. Everything kind of happened uh, very, very fortunately for us. But when you say directed, all three of you guys directed all three it. Of us I, directed. I've never heard of a movie being directed by three people before. Yeah, well, you know, we, and, and we were first time directors. Yeah. And it was a comedy without comedians. So this was not an easy sell. Right. But, uh, you know, one guy happened to get it or was crazy. And that's Michael Eisner, who was the head of Paramount at the time. Yeah. So he, uh, he just heard about the idea and said, uh, called up his vice president, uh, Don Simpson, and said, uh, if we don't own this script on Monday, you're, you, know, you can be looking for another job or some kind of you know, humorous threat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyways, so we started, we, we landed at Paramount and it was really fortunate. And, uh, and, then, and Paramount took us through a rewrite and helped it help the script immensely. They helped it. No kidding. They helped the it. studio yeah, no, we, helped the we script. Actually, you don't hear that these, a lot. We're these little guys from Milwaukee, you know, the big bad studio, and yeah. we're faced with Barry Diller, Michael Eisner, Jeff Katzenberg, Frank Mancuso, wow. all these you know, big heavyweights. Damn. And, um, and so, and, and Katzenberg, <laughs> we were walking on the lot. He said, don't be so paranoid, basically. He said, uh, you know, we think this movie could go through the roof. And that's the first time I ever heard that expression, go through the roof. You yeah, know, we were like so new. And, uh, and so Katzenberg said, let us, we're gonna just approve, improve the story. You know, we're not gonna take any of your jokes out or stuff. So, so we did. And, you know, there's a guy named Tom Perry who was their, you know, their uh, script guy. And he worked with us every day and we rewrote the script. We added the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the bar, the Magumba bar, which had yeah. the, the disco thing. Yeah. Uh, we added the, you know, the beach scene where the, the from here to eternity. Yeah. And the jungle scene. And, you know, all these flashbacks, which yeah. really uh, got the audience invested in the love story, which turned out to be hugely important. Cause, because that's, you know, if we can ostensibly get people to care about the characters, uh, then it, it takes the pressure off of the jokes. So it's not, it doesn't become a joke book. 
That's yeah. interesting because, you know, with the Marx Brothers, there was so little concern about story. And it was also gag comedy and it was also very verbal. Right. Um, it was totally gag driven. And the Marx Brothers, you know, uh, they did, um, you know, the, of course, the ones that they did in New York at Astoria Studios. Uh, um, you know, the one about the Florida uh, coconuts. Yeah. And then, then they did Animal Crackers, which were actually uh, stage shows. They were plays first, you know, right. Plays, and, but then they did um, Horse Feathers and a couple of other ones, were, which were pretty good um, and did all right. Um, maybe because they were a low budget, but then they did a movie called Duck Soup. Yeah. Which in college, we thought this was the funniest thing ever made. We yeah. just died laughing. And, uh, but Duck Soup bombed at the box office. Oh, did it really? It didn't have any story. And it was yeah. just a collection of jokes. It was a joke book. Just yeah. jokes. And the ending, which, you know, I came to l learn counts for half in movies. I don't yeah. know if, uh, dramas, but certainly in comedy your ending counts as half. And they just ended on the last joke. So um, in an airplane, we took an already existing movie. You probably heard about this. Zero Hour. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And that was written by the brilliant Arthur Haley, who was a story guy. He didn't write yeah. jokes. We wrote the jokes, but we used Arthur Haley's story. Right. Well, the, unfortunately, the lesson we took from Airplane uh, was, uh, well, you fill up 90 minutes full of jokes and we got a movie. So that's what we did with Top Secret. Yeah. And we just couldn't wait for Top Secret to, to be released. And, you know, Top Secret has the, probably the best jokes we've ever written in it. Um, but it didn't, um, didn't leave audiences with a feeling of satisfaction after they, you know, when the lights go up, that's really when you win or lose in the movie. If, uh, right. If the audience has learned something and if, the, and if the boy and girl have tied up something in addition to one of the characters uh, completing an arc and overcoming some kind of an intrinsic uh, problem that, right. that he she has, right. um, if, you, if you haven't done that, you, you lose. And yeah. we were re released, uh, Top Secret re was released on the same day as Karate Kid. Oh, now, no kidding. Karate Kid, does, you know, people aren't really, that's not a real big cult classic, but, you know, it's a better movie than, as far as a story and, yeah. and structure and characters yeah. than Top Secret. Yeah. So, you know, I, I have arguments with, with friends all the time. They just, because they just love Top Secret. But, right. you know, we also love Duck, Duck Stoop. But uh, the Marx Brothers were kicked out of Paramount over that. No kidding. Yeah, they, they, they were fired. They, they, and then they didn't have a studio. And, you know, Chico was playing cards with Irving Thalberg, who was the head of uh, MGM. Uh -huh. And he said, you could make twice the money with half the jokes and ditch Zeppo. And, you know, we'll, we'll do a movie. Right. So they did. So they did. You never saw Zeppo <laughs> after that. Yeah. Oh, that's brutal. Um, oh, I, I meant to tell you, I had a funny story about, um, about Robert Hayes. Oh, yeah. I, I was doing this. We did a benefit, this huge benefit in uh, Sun Valley, Idaho. And it was for a bunch of millionaires that were playing golf, and they brought in some comedians. So, uh, so Robert Hayes and myself and two other comedians get on a private jet. It's the only time I've ever been on a private jet in my life. Yeah. And we're going to fly from L.A. to Sun Valley, Idaho. And I just, I, I can't believe it. I get, I get on the plane and I'm, and I'm looking at this guy and I'm like, I had no idea who was going to be on the plane. Oh. And so we take off. And as you know, he's just one of the warmest, funniest, nice yeah, guys to so be nice. around. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so we take off. He doesn't off. belong in this business. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is he oh, he's that nice? He's so yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But we've become good friends, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So the pilot comes back, there's two pilots, and one of them comes back, and he meets him, gets his autograph, and he says, uh, and Robert Hayes says, you know, funny thing, I actually went out because of airplane, and I got my pilot's license. And yeah. the pilot says, no kidding. And he said, yeah, I just fell in love with flying, and I've been doing it ever since. He goes, you want to fly the plane? And he's like, sure. And I'm like, whoa, 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 this guy did a comedy about yeah. flying, not a he, drama. Yeah. A comedy. Yeah. He's a guy who sweats too much. You <laughs> exactly. Know? This, yeah. 
Yeah, so he went up and he flew the plane the rest of the flight. It was awesome. Great. Did he land it? No. But it was a jet, right? Yeah. Okay. But I guess he's, quali he's qualified for jets. I guess so. Yeah. But I was, there was a, they used to have these uh, NAFTA uh, or NATO conventions in Vegas where um, it was the National Association of Theater Owners. Yeah. So all the exhibitors were there. And so Paramount flew us in a jet. It was it's like slightly bigger than just a, a little private jet. But uh -huh. I can't, I remember Jim Brooks was on it and, and a bunch of Paramount stars. And, uh, and, 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 and John Travolta, we, who we'd actually met from being on the lot. It was, it was amazing. And, wow. so, and Travolta uh, went into the cockpit and flew the plane for a while. And he, I think he may have landed it too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I know he, uh, I had a friend that did a film that they shot in Baltimore called Ladder 49. And he was so, he was so nice that every other weekend, Anybody that lived in L.A. that wanted to see their families, he loaded them into his plane. And he had a converted 747 that oh, had wow. a dining room, that had a screening oh, yeah. room. Yeah. And so all these people, he'd load it up with people from L.A. And they'd get on it, gourmet chef. He'd cook them, you know, first-class meals and, uh, and come back, you know, leave on Friday night after filming and, and be back again on, on Sunday night late. That's and he'd cool. fly the plane. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So. Um, how many times do you think you've been in a private jet? Um, I, I don't know, dozens of times, I think, because, you know, when, we, when I was doing movies for uh, Dimension, you know, we'd fly back and forth to New York, you know, and have meetings with Bob Weinstein. Yeah. On the, on the, on the, yeah, the Miramax jet. Uh-huh. And that was when Harvey was not in prison yet. Yeah, pre-prison Harvey. I remember him. He was something else. Yeah. But I, I mainly worked with Bob. Really? Yeah. Oh. Who's, you know, could be difficult, but, you know, he was always straight with me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, he wasn't. Uh, and, you know, I didn't have, Harvey would show up at the previews. Uh-huh. Like at the first preview. And no matter how bad they, the first previews were, Harvey would laugh and think it was great, you know, kind of like Sherry Lansing. You know, we, do, we did, you know, the first previews of comedies are always dreadful. Yeah. And then the studio executives, I don't know, they, they're, they just think, oh, this is great. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Um, yeah, comedy is a funny thing in, in, the, in the hands of networks. I know just from we're writing on sitcoms, it's like that you get these people that, they became development executives and then production executives by getting coffee for somebody. You know, they were interns. Yeah, they start that way, yeah. Yeah, they didn't start by writing scripts. They didn't start by raising money for an independent film. And, and all of a sudden, you're taking notes from somebody who's, you know, 28 years old, and they, and they went to Harvard, and, and they, they've never made anybody laugh in their lives. It's insane. Right. But, you know... You know, it could be good or bad. I think, you know, Eisner, Michael Eisner was probably of the first generation of studio executives that, that weren't these, you know, seat of the pants, instinct guys. I mean, uh, you know, Eisner is that, but he was more of a, uh, you know, uh, you know, he has a graduate degree and, you know, kind of a button down college, serious college guy. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know what Diller's background is, but, but uh, I, don't, I don't even know if... Uh, Katzenberg was working in politics, I think, in New York. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he worked for John Lindsay. Uh -huh. Oh, really? A long time ago, yeah. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you were researching... Oh, I should mention, by the way, Air, Airplane is 40 years old. It's uh, celebrating its anniversary this year. Yeah, it's a 40-year anniversary. And the way you're celebrating is the, it's being re-released, uh, which means probably almost exclusively in drive-ins, or I guess there's some theaters that are open around the country? I don't know specifically, but there's some website or number you can call, which I right. don't have with yeah. me right now. But I think it's also on Apple TV. It's on, um, it's on Netflix, I can tell on you Netflix? that. Yeah, okay. I watched it on Netflix last night. Okay. And uh, I was going to say, when you, when you wrote the movie, 
did you research it by flying a lot? Like, did you ever get on a flight just for the sake of research? No, Greg, we, we have no collection with, a connection with real life. We, <laughs> we totally, we, all we do is watch old movies, <laughs> old serious movies. Yeah, yeah. And then that's all we know. Yeah. And if you've, you know, if you've seen these scenes from Zero Hour, uh, you know, all our, all our scenes are pretty much, they look like that. In fact, right. we wanted to do the movie in black and white and on a prop plane. Uh -huh. But uh, Eisner fortunately talked us out of it. Yeah. A lot more situations in a 747. Yeah, I think it was, we, we wanted to make it look like the old prop plane. So I think we used a, a 707 which, you know, they had four engines and two on two seating. Our, our plane was two and three because some, um, some scenes needed three people to be mm -hmm. on. Like, so we had the couple with the little boy, Joey. Right. That was a three. Yeah. And then the black dudes, of course, were two. So yeah. we could just put it and we put people anywhere we wanted. Yeah. You know, every time I watch the movie, and I've seen it so many times, but you always pick up something new. Uh, there, there's so many things going on in the background. And, yeah, uh, people tell me that. And, yeah. and so last night when I watched it again, there was a line that I had had some edible marijuana, so I was maybe laughing a little more than I would have. But there was a, there was a scene with the stewardess, and she's, uh, she's talking to another stewardess, and she's very upset that she's – um, never been married. She's 26 and I'm so old now and now I don't think I'll ever get married and her head is down and she's crying. <laughs> and then she turns around and, uh, and, a, and a, a passenger comes up to say that her husband's sick. And she says, well, do you think he'll be all right? I don't know. It's really terrible. I think he might die. And uh, you know, this, uh, I don't know if the plane's going to go down. And then she stops and goes, but at least I've got a husband. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My brain is lying. <laughs> yeah, it's actually my favorite joke of the movie. Really? Yeah. When oh, I get asked God. That, that thing was funny 40 years ago. It's funny today, and it'll be fun, funny in 40 years. It's just, and, I, and I butchered it. I butchered it. But. You did, really. And that was about the worst telling I've ever <laughs> heard of. But, I, um, <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. But, that's okay. but you know, I, when I do a Q&A, they ask me, what's my favorite joke in the movie? You know, well, you know, it's a close... It's a tie between Ethel Merman yes. and, uh, and that joke, at least I've got a husband. I mean, where do you find that? That's I also crazy. think there's lines that became vernacular that people used all the time. Like, oh, yeah. uh, do you want some cream in your coffee? No, I take my coffee like my men, black. I take it black like my men. And exactly. I don't know, if, I, don't, I mean, that, can you imagine, you know, the studio executives going through a script today? Yeah. And say, no, you can't say that. You can't have a 12 year old girl say that. Or they, or they slap an R rating on us or something. Yeah, you know? right. right. Uh, was but, that, that uh, was PG, right? Airplane? It was actually PG because it was yeah. before, I think Spielberg invented PG 13 for Raiders. Uh, one of his movies, it started, he, they needed something between PG and R. Right, right, right. But, uh, yeah, no, the airplane definitely is not PG. It's, I think it's yeah. PG-13, yeah. Yeah, and um, I keep wanting to go back to Kentucky Fried Movie because I haven't seen it in a while, but it was such a big influence. When, in that movie, I mean, talk about things you couldn't do today. Yeah. There was did, a did, scene where, where you have a guy who's like a famous stuntman daredevil. Yes, that's why I was just thinking of that. And he said he danger seekers. Yeah, and, and the announcer says he, you know, confronts it, challenges it, and licks it. Yeah, and danger seekers, and then what the John Smith, and uh, he goes into the middle of a bunch of black. Well, first guys. he puts a helmet on. Oh, he puts a helmet on. <laughs> yeah, and he's yeah. got a jumpsuit. Yeah, yeah thank you for yeah. reminding me of that. <laughs> and, and then he screams the N word and runs. Yeah. And that, that yeah, to me is run. like, in the seventies and the eighties, that was just like. Uh, that was what comedy was. It was a crazy situation and it was, you know, daring to say things that weren't okay. But like you said, if it makes people laugh, it's okay. That's yeah, it. The only criteria is nothing at all funny. offensive about it. It's like, yeah. you know, uh, the scene had, there were about, you know, a, a dozen uh, black guys in it. And so yeah. obviously they were okay with it. Right. Right. And yeah. So, and, 
and we and you know we've you know it's 40 year anniversary and some of the reviews and the articles are saying you know there's certain things that are in questionable taste I'm yeah. saying, what are they talking about like yeah. the black dudes you know yeah. and then a woman trying to translate uh uh you know a jive jive to white people and then yeah. but the thing is the the super uh, we supered in the translation on yeah. the screen yeah. And it's like for she, he, uh, we put golly. I mean, <laughs> right, right. It's, it's, I'm, and I know black people just love that because yeah. he was laughing at white people. So yeah. it's fine. It's, right. It was very, it was very even handed, but and it was a time where certainly people were less sensitive. Yeah. Now everything is like analyzed and, you know, taken down. And as soon as you start doing that, you lose the laugh. Right, right. And um, the other thing about uh, Kentucky Fried Movie was that I saw bits, you know, like in the same way that Woody Allen, when I read Woody Allen's like Without Feathers and I uh, forget his other book. There he, were, just had, he just wrote a book that I read. Um, oh, really? Apropos of nothing. Yeah. Well, I'll read it. I'm still on board. Um, so there were, little, there were little kernels of things that later went into his stand-up and then from his stand-up, they went into became scenes in his movies. And I think you did the same thing with uh, the Kentucky Fried movie. There was there were little, I mean, including the gay guy from Airplane who says, uh, "What do you what do you make of this?" Well, it's a hat, it's a bro. Yeah, and well, actually, further back than that, we uh, we did that on stage in Kentucky Fried Theater. Really, a lot of those gays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did a courtroom scene. Yeah, and the movie courtroom scene in Kentucky Fried Movie was an expanded version of of what we did on stage with a lot of the same jokes. Yep, you yep. know the dildo and all that stuff we did on stage. And I then, had to rewind it because they didn't see the dildo the first time. You're talking about the in the uh, in the in, kung fu parody. Oh no, I'm talking about in Kentucky Fried Movie in the in the courtroom scene. He was doing oh, it. Oh, right, so, right, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And then we did on stage, you know, there's a lot of stuff. And, and um, you know, and then, uh, you know, the, the um, where Robert Stack goes, uh, passengers cert certain to die, airline negligent, and then Stucker says, there's a sale at pennies. That we did on stage. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and, and most of that stuff, most of those lines, you know, we, we could never write for Stucker. He always, you know, we didn't write gags for him. So, for instance, uh, for the, um, th that scene where they do the press conference yeah. and Stucker takes over, and, um, and, and so they're asking him all these questions. And what kind of a plane in it is it? You know, what, yeah. we called Steve on the telephone. This was back in, you know, 19, uh, probably 1979. And asked him all these questions, and he came back with all the answers. And it was all, all his, just the, off the top of his head. Really? And he said, oh, it's a big, pretty white plane. With it red looks like a Tylenol. Tylenol. And that's <laughs> right out of Stucker. Right now. That's great. Now, is he a comedian? Uh, he was actually, we found him, he was a piano player. He was never a stand-up or anything. Hmm. He was a piano player for a ballet school that was up the block on Pico and we had some mutual friends who and we were trying to find a piano player because our piano player from uh, Madison who was very funny wouldn't come out and we were kind of tearing our hair out what are we going to do and then yeah. they recommended well you got to get Stucker and so yeah. we didn't know it. and and you know we were these you know very uh, white bread midwestern guys and we didn't know from gay and yeah. sucker shows up in two-tone leather hop pants in a pink vw <laughs> beetle and you know sequins and beads and you know and he and he sits down to, to play the piano we were building the theater at the time and you know there's construction stuff all around and he just pounded out you know elton john's take me to the pilot and we were just like blown away yeah and he was funny but not in the way that we could write for him or that, right and and we were kind of holding our breath you know how would he work in this show because he was so unlike anything we had in the show but as it turned out you know we could all be on stage and you know 
picking our nose and nobody we would, would watch. I mean, everybody was watching Stucker. When, right, when, right. When he was just amazing on stage. Yeah, I noticed that in the movie. He cut, you take him in and out of frame very quickly because he would steal focus. Yeah. If he no, was he's just, it. he's in his sweet treats. And, you know, there, there, we, found, we were looking for stock footage for the POV of Bob Hayes and Julie Haggerty as they're landing the plane. And so there was one POV where the runway lights go off. So we yeah. thought, oh my God, that's amazing. What, we should do something with that. And so we thought of uh, having Stucker with, the, with the, the plug saying, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So, and I, I never know, I always assumed, or I, maybe I heard rumors that, um, that a lot of these guys hadn't done comedy. Like Leslie Nielsen, had he done much comedy before? No, no, none of them. We picked, we picked them because they hadn't done comedy. And, yeah. you know, uh, Stack was all proud of having just done uh, 1941. Yeah. And with Spielberg. He, he was doing it with Spielberg. It was like he, right. was, he was so jazzed. He would tell us stories on set about how it was working with, how it was to work with Spielberg and it was so funny and everything. And, uh, and meanwhile, Paramount tried to make a deal with Stack where he would take less money in points uh -huh. uh, on the back end. And he didn't, Stack just took, you know, everything up front. He didn't have any confidence in airplane, although he was a great guy. I yeah. love Robert Stack. Yeah. And, uh, and, and he was, and so somebody, Somebody was sitting behind him in the first screening, the, the cast and crew screening, and the lights go up, and he turns to his wife and said, never in my life have I ever been so wrong about anything. Not, not know, taking the points. He would have made a lot did, of money with points. Yeah, he huh? would have made you know, more money. But um, he, he was really great, and once he signed on, he was, uh, he was all in, and... You know, we being from Wisconsin and knowing nothing, you know, we would look at this guy and think, well, it's Elliot Ness. You know, he's just humorless and, you know, but he was, you know, very funny guy, always yeah. telling funny stories. And, uh, and, and, you know, some, some jokes he never thought would work. We heard later that he and Leslie were just shaking their heads over uh, the shit hitting the fan. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they said, they said, this will never work. This will never work. And then it happened, it worked. And so, you know, it's just like they, you know, they, this kind of thing had never been tried before. But did you direct them? Because I know like with the, with the Marx Brothers, I had heard that they, they never directed Margaret Dumont to try to be funny. They, she was a serious right. actress and they oh, said, yeah, play no, it we, did you do that with these guys? You just yeah, we, Kennedy and them just play it told, straight? The, the main, the direction I've used most with actors is I tell them, let the lines do the work. You don't have to be funny. In the first uh, table read of Naked Gun, uh, Priscilla Presley was very nervous. And she said, you know, I don't know how to be funny. I don't, I don't think I can be funny. I said, you don't have to. Just, again, let the lines do the work. And we, we want you to act exactly as you I acted in Dallas, you know, just, we, we just need straight right. stuff. From right. The same, the cast also. And, you know, in the later movies, when Leslie would try to mug a little bit, it wasn't as funny. Right. And, you know, we kind of learned about the character going forward that he, he just had to be unflappable and always just cruise through everything smoothly. And, uh, you know, Leslie read the script, immediately got it. He had, he told us he had done a mash once, and we, I think we we said, we'll we'll try to forget about that because <laughs> we, we didn't want any comedy to taint any of this. We what just, gave and, you that instinct? What made you guys go in that direction versus going out and trying to hire the the comedic actors of the day? Well, back in college, you know, we we you know when we smoke weed and watch these serious movies. And we would laugh hysterically, and then read, and then later in Kentucky Fried Theater, we would redub the movies. Yeah, um, and and make gags that way. And so, one one day we we happened to see this movie Zero Hour, and it just occurred to us, instead of just redubbing this thing, let's just remake it. 
And yeah. that was that was the key. That was the breakthrough. Right. Will we make it not with Dom DeLuise and Harvey Corman? Yeah. Uh, or Chevy Chase and Bill Murray. Yeah. But uh, and they're all fine guys and comedians. But we'll make it with Robert Stack and you know just serious actors. Yeah. And that that became that was the breakthrough. And so, you know, we were we felt ourselves being kind of like uh, Columbus, I suppose, when he went to the king and queen and said, well, I want to sail west. And, you know, there's land out there. Uh -huh. And they would go, you're crazy, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. So we wanted to make a, com a comedy with all these straight actors. And, you know, Bob Hayes had been in a sitcom, but it's not even like he had to be funny in that sitcom. Right. And when we saw an episode of it, you know, we kind of gulped and said, well, you know, we'll have to, you know, we don't want that guy. Yeah. We want Bob Hayes, the actor. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and Hayes turned about, it turned out to be, you know, so, you know, so adept at comedy and, and this kind of comedy, because, you know, um, you know, when he says uh, it's a different kind of flying altogether and uh, Leslie and the stewardess go, it's, it's a, a different, different kind of flying. It's an entirely different kind of flying. And, use yeah. it. and then Hayes does a reaction to that that is so subtle and so right on yeah. that, you know, who knows if we really would have gotten the laugh, you know, without that. Yeah. So he would be like a, a tight end who'd catch the ball and, you know, find his own way into the end zone. Yeah. Yeah, right. And Julie Haggerty, I think if, if anybody, if I got the sense that any of them was, comed was, was putting a little bit of comedic spin on it, it was her. She could play it so straight, but, well, but her character was so, something about it was so much funnier. Well, the thing is, she didn't put any spin on it because that was, that is Julie. She's, she's, she's actually soft. like that. Yeah. She's very soft spoken, very yeah. sweet. Yeah. Uh, very innocent. Oh, and, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. She's exactly like that. Whereas other actresses came in and read for the part and they had to act their way to it. And some right. of them were really good. Right. Um, but but Ju when Julie read, we, we and, and we met her, we talked to her, and she just was playing herself. Yeah. We said, Oh, that this is the one. This yeah. Is, this is the one. Yeah. Um, you had uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was in the movie, and then you later famously had OJ in the Naked Gun movies. What, what, what's the thinking in getting an athlete to be in a comedy movie? Well, you know, for Airplane, the, the thinking was, um, you know, they used athletes in movies, and they could obviously not act. Oh, yeah, James Brown, then, James Brown right? I think James Brown was in one, but... Um, OJ was in one. Actually, we, you know, it was kind of based on OJ in, yeah. uh, what was that movie with the moon landing? It was a fake moon landing. Uh, Capricorn remember. one. Uh -huh. But they would use, they would get athletes because they could get more people in the theater, I guess. Right. Hey, right. It's, an, it's an athlete. So yeah. we wanted to address that head on and drop in a non-actor athlete right into the thing. And then to top it off, have somebody blow the cover. <laughs> you're not an actor. Yeah, right. You're that, you're that sports star. And, yeah. so, and that's what we did. Yeah. And actually, curiously enough, the first one we went after was Pete Rose. Because I don't know, we, uh, so many things were corrected, things, mistakes that we made that were just miraculously corrected. Um, but uh, Pete Rose was, uh, I don't know if he got the script or but it was it was getting to be summer and we were starting to shoot I, maybe we shot in june or july or something and it was baseball season and pete rose was still active either as a player or a player manager so uh-huh so this is all pre-scandal yeah what? so this is all pre-scandal yeah oh yeah wait yeah yeah and so um we, and this was once we were at paramount uh we were getting close to shooting and and, you know, some, I don't know where the suggestion came from. How about Kareem? And we rewrote it. And it's 10 times better with Kareem. Yeah. Not anything against Pete Rose, but uh, I was going to say Pete Rose would have been a gamble. I'm not making that joke. 
<laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> but, but Kareem had this, was more controversial at the time. Yeah. Because he did have that knock against them that he didn't try and that, you know. And so right, right. nothing had ever been done like that before. Yeah. And uh, it's also physically very funny to put a guy that big in the cockpit. Yeah, which we, I don't think we even thought about it or we, we didn't care. But, you know, we did make the joke when they did haul him out, he was wearing his uh, basketball shorts. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> we don't comment on it. Just it's just that's it. <laughs> great. Oh yeah. my god! I mean, I could go through this movie beat by beat. I just I can't believe how well it hand it holds up. That I could watch it as a thirteen year old and say this is the funny movie I've ever, uh, funniest movie I've ever seen, and watch it as a fifty four year old and have the same reaction. I truly believe it's the funniest movie ever made. And oh, thank you. Yeah, and I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. I really think I think it's it's probably. Probably Blazing Saddles to me that, and Raising Arizona, and and I guess maybe Duck Soup. I don't care if it didn't have a story. I'll throw that in. No, there I think too. you're right. No, Duck Soup has the funniest gags in it of yeah. any Marx Brothers movie. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But uh, yeah, of course, uh, Night at the Opera had a better story. Right. And, it, and, it and then in the next movie they did, Thalberg died, and so and Louis B. Mayer hated them and made sure that they got the worst directors and the worst writers and all their movies were shit after that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. they really was a steady decline, wasn't it? Yeah, it was terrible. But yeah. Look, you know, the, the great movies they did were amazing. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you my friend okay. and I hope sure. to talk to you again. Sure. Likewise. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care. Okay.